welcome back to another episode of the nonprofit show. I'm really excited to talk with our guest today. Welcome, Sarah Quillen, Executive Director of ILAD. Wow, we have a lot to talk about because already in the green room, we were freaking out our producer because we were talking, talking, talking. I, I tend to do that because your your show is just so great and there's so many practical things from it. I, so I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to be a part of this um, this endeavor. Thank you. That's very nice. Well, I thought of you for two reasons. Um, your name came across my desk and I can't even remember how, but I was thinking about um, Lyme's disease and this like mysterious illness that swirls around. Um, I know in my family, I live in the West, so we don't really deal with this as much, but I have family in the East and they had like chronic health problems and it took well over a decade to figure out that they had Lyme's disease. And this family member was an accountant. And so he wasn't like the typical, they were like, you know, how would you get this type of, you know, thing? And then Matt marry that to the conversation of culture, nonprofit culture. I was like, I got to get this woman on the nonprofit show because <laughs> we have a lot to talk about. <laughs> there's a lot going on. I know, a lot going on. And I must say, there's always a lot going on on the nonprofit show. So you're my type of woman because we got to get into it. Another thing that I want to make sure that we do is honor our amazing supporters. And they come to us from Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, your part-time controller, Fundraisers Friday, and 180 Management Group. These are the folks that allow us now for more than five years. Well, actually, we're in our fifth year, um, but more than uh, 1,100 shows to, to be in business and to, to bring these episodes to you each and every day. We also have this amazing group of co-hosts. They are fabulous. They join me from all over the country, and I hope you're getting to know them and, and really um, love them. I have to say as much as I do. Okay. Sarah Quillen, executive director, international Lyme and associated disease society. And, and we go with I lads. <laughs> yeah. Well done. So talk about this, like this issue first. Um, and then we'll put it into perspective as from you in terms of being a leader and talking about culture, but I do want to back up and talk about Lyme's disease and, and, and also that word associated diseases. So thank you for, for backing up and giving, allowing me the time to give a little bit of perspective and background on, on Lyme disease. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm sure people have probably heard of it uh, or, yeah. you know, they, they know like you, they know somebody who's had it. Um, to a different degree. So, so basically Lyme disease is a bacterial infection caused by a spiral shaped bacterium, what we call a spirochete. Uh, and it's actually the official Latin term is Borrelia burgdorferi. Um, so in its early stages, Lyme disease can result in a, in a rash or joint pain or headaches, very basic symptoms. Uh, and then later stages can, can run way deeper and way more serious arthritis, cognitive difficulties, major fatigue, a myriad of other symptoms that really have a debilitating effect on patients' lives. Um, the CDC uh, has estimated over 476,000 new cases of Lyme disease each year in the US. And in general, it comes from the bite of a tick, um, but we're also finding that it's, it's coming from a number of other, um, other passages like fleas and things like that. Um, it's a complex disease, um, and it actually, I'll, I'll go back to the associated disease part um, that you mentioned in a second. It's, it's often difficult to diagnose um, yeah. and treat effectively. For the people who are lucky, and I will say my father has dealt with Lyme disease. He's had five different bouts of Lyme disease, and most mm -hmm. of the times he, he, he now knows exactly how to um, self-diagnose because he knows his symptoms he gets the joint pain and he knows, all right, I don't normally have that. This is weird. Let me go get tested. And he, he knows enough to go to the doctor very quickly. But a lot of people either don't go to the doctor, ignore the symptoms, don't have the normal symptoms or are misdiagnosed. Um, and, and the more you get into this community, you will learn 
some truly horrendous stories of, of patients who've gone years misdiagnosed, underdiagnosed, treated inappropriately, um, treated for other things that they didn't end up having, and it didn't end up alleviate their suffering. Um, and so that was really the impetus of where ILADS was born. And we're actually celebrating our 25th anniversary this year. So we, we have come quite a long way. I would imagine that you have had to become a PR and communications juggernaut. Oh, um, you are not kidding. You so, know, like so my background is actually in fundraising and PR. Um, and so I, I find myself very fortunate to have that experience and that background yeah. in addition to program implementation in coming into this role. Mm -hmm. It's such a fascinating thing because, um, you're on, I've got to believe you're like on the cutting edge of trying to bring a lot of cultures together from, you know, the PR and the communications culture, which is a whole thing, the medical culture, talking about different aspects of, of these associated diseases. Um, I can't ever think of a time when I've seen an organization use that word associated diseases. In essence, communicating that there are a lot of things going on. It's that it's not just one thing. So, wow, what a heavy lift. It, it's amazing, though. I mean, it, I, I so enjoy this kind of work because I know that I am serving. I always need to serve a purpose in, in my work and it, you know, it, it fulfills me personally. And of course, having the family connection makes it that much more. But ILADS is a, is a fairly small medical society. We're not, we're, we're under 600 members. We are global. Um, and you mentioned talking about being uh, in the, coming from the West. Um, that's a, it's a little bit of a, a misconception that, um, okay. that Lyme disease doesn't exist out West. It's only something in the Northeast. Mm -hmm. It's not. And we have members all across the U S actually our largest membership right now is in California, uh, where yeah. people have no idea that there's, there's Lyme disease, there's yeah. Bartonella, there's Babesiosis, there's Rickettsia. And there's a, there's a whole list of, um, complex illnesses um, that all kind of come in together um, and really make their way into, into a patient's life. Wow. Well, let's talk about culture from the perspective that you've had. Um, you, you've been fortunate or unfortunate <laughs> to, to live through because I always love when um, an active professional who's serving in the nonprofit sector can come and share their wisdom with us. I mean, somebody who, dare I say, you're in the trenches, right? Yeah. So let's start with how you define nonprofit culture and how do you see it working? So I actually don't necessarily make the distinction between nonprofit and versus for-profit. And I follow the, the um, I think we should be called for impact versus nonprofits, uh, if you're of that uh, genre, because I, I feel that this is one of the challenges that I think the nonprofit community and associations, um, especially because we're nonprofit, that gives us a, a free reign to not necessarily have infrastructure, to not spend money on administrative things that um, every penny needs to go directly to programs. And while, yes, we absolutely must maximize those those hard earned donations, mm -hmm. there's a there's a responsibility that we have to the donor, to the constituent, to the patients, to to all the folks who are part of our organization that it, to be run correctly, that requires infrastructure um, and it can be something as simple as um, policies and procedures and right. having all the um, all the software in place to be able to to carry on the day to day. So so the long answer is I, I actually I think the definition should all be for impact. You exist mm -hmm. to make an impact in not just your specific community, but in all the communities, because all the boats, all the boats raise with the tide. Right. Mm -hmm. When we all work together and all have one unified um, purpose that's that that is how we all succeed yeah wow i i love your direction here and i think that this is um such an interesting conversation because i feel as though 
when you start out with that parameter and that that concept it really changes how you look at culture right i mean and i think one of the things that i have seen uh is that when you have something especially with boards that you you can exercise or um you can inculcate a concept with your board that they can go back into their community, whether it be for profit or maybe other board service. To your point, everything is elevated, everything advances forward. And so I love that you can link through this issue or this concept to, you know, the, the, the private sector, or corporate sector, however you want to look at it, the for profit sector. You came into an organization experiencing change. And I want to talk to you a little bit about cultural shift. And when do we know that we are in it? Um, it's not human nature to say, woohoo, change. <laughs> right? <laughs> How do we do this? <laughs> most, most of us come in going, oh, no, change is bad, bad. No, no. Right. Yeah. Until yeah. we're forced into it. And, oh, oh, I guess we need to, I guess we need to do something about that, don't we? Because now we don't have a choice. Uh, and I have to say, I mean, in, again, in in my experience, I've, I've, I came to ILADS after that the, the band aid was ripped off, so to speak, where the, um, the my predecessor, the executive director, who was the only executive director for this organization oh. for, for 23 years, God love her, finally said, I want to retire. I want to spend time with my family and and yeah. enjoy life while I still can. So I. I absolutely applaud her, still applaud her in in making what I think was a bold move because she she truly was the champion of this organization. And again, we're we're a medical society. So our membership consists of clinicians and researchers in this in this um, Lyme disease community. And though they all run their own practices and run their own offices, sure. this is often the very first nonprofit that they've been, if they're in a leadership role, right? And yes. and for better or for worse, relied very heavily on that executive director role and, and the small but mighty team behind the scenes, like a little Wizard of Oz. Mm -hmm. And so when she announced her retirement, the board had this like, you know, mouth open, gaping, oh, what do we do <laughs> now? And and luckily, I mean, they, God love them, they, they pivoted and learned a lot really fast and went through the whole process of identifying well, what, where do we want to go? Right. Rather than like, let's just throw a body in to replace. They, I give them, I give them big kudos in this because this is, this is scary stuff. We're looking yeah. at not just a strategic plan for the next couple of years. Like what, where's the direction of the organization right. and where do we want this mission to go? Yeah. And, and, we want to bring in a leader that who can help us with that mission. Um, mm -hmm. And so they, they embarked on a, a year long process uh, before I even came in the door of, of, of all of that, that strategic vision and all that kind of stuff. So I, I give props to them for I, I, coming back to what you're saying. I think we're often, we, we don't want change, but when it happens to us, we, as we're passively going through life, when it happens to us, some can rise to meet it and then some maybe not so much. So I, I, I love that I lads rose to meet it in full force. You know, it's also interesting. I think um, in the structure of a nonprofit association, you know, you cannot discount the um, competitive nature and financially competitive nature um, of researchers and people that are in it for, um, you know, they have their own thing. They don't want someone to steal their cheese. So that yet they they recognize that their strength and numbers and the collaborative nature of moving forward. But there is also still a competitive set, right? We see this in the nonprofit sector. I mean, I could drive down the street and talk to you about this shelter, that food bank, this dog shelter, this cultural organization. Um, we're not always the best at playing in the same sandbox. Well, and interestingly, and I, yes, I totally agree. And ILADS is no different in that. And, no? and again, we have, we have a, a whole bunch of very competitive 
clinicians who sure. this is their this is their their bailiwick, right? Mm -hmm. um, but interestingly, so they're in this community. There are there are precious few number of organizations that even help to serve the Lyme community. ILADS is the only medical society doing what we do um, in this community. And, mm -hmm. and there's a few other organizations. And, and interestingly, they're all kind of, it's a, we're a small community, right? So everybody kind of mm -hmm. knows each other. We all kind of know mm -hmm. the players and things like that. The, the funding that comes to Lyme disease is so little in terms of federal funding. I mean, it's like single digits that, that actually mm -hmm. go to Lyme disease research. So all the funding that comes into this community is private. It is all mm. private foundations, private donations from individuals, um, from groups. And there's a there's a wonderful warrior group across the country who are patients seeking help for themselves, but then also seeking help for other folks. So so one of the big things that I I I aspire to, and I truly believe in, and, and this has been throughout my whole career, I believe in the importance of collaboration and partnerships. And it, mm -hmm. it can look different for yeah. every relationship, but it is so crucial. And it is especially crucial in, just as you're saying, in the, the players that don't necessarily like to play in the same sandbox. And mm -hmm. I, I came in and it's not like I had to force us all into the same sandbox. I, I, I use my newness, right? This is the, this is yeah. the, the fun sure. part of culture change. Yeah. You yeah. can pick up the phone or I'm old fashioned. I'll still pick up the phone, but you can email or, or reach out to mm -hmm. these other organizations going, Hey, I'm new. I don't have the whatever politics and history that may have transpired mm -hmm. years ago. And mm -hmm. we're all in the same boat together. Again, mm -hmm. one voice is much stronger. So Hey, mm -hmm. let's work together. How do we do that? And then it, it's opened the door in any conversation that I've had. It's opened the door so wide, and and the and we're we're now working with other um, other medical associations that focus on similar mm -hmm. audiences, other patients. We're working with other mm -hmm. the, all kinds of new groups are popping up. Going, hey, can we work together? What can we do? Um, right. We actually we have a, our annual scientific conference that we do we're doing this year in San Antonio in November, mm -hmm. and it's it's predominantly for clinicians. Um, mm -hmm. We you know it's medical CME. There's lots of lots of very cool sure. science and medical things, but I in a, in an effort to try to throw open our doors, I am reaching out to other associations, other community mm -hmm. organizations, and offering them like, hey, we'll give you an afternoon track of education focused on pediatrics. Um, wow. Hey, we'll offer you a complimentary exhibit table if you'll come and and share your information with us and we'll do the same. And I mean, those are the kind of things like using whatever opportunities we have mm -hmm. to bring to the table, proverbial table. Um, and that's been that's been huge for us. You know, that's a it leads me to my next conversation point that I want to explore with you. And, and that is in terms of a culture shift, um, when division occurs, I think it's a cool strategy and it's it's a brave strategy to, to throw that barn door open even wider and bring in new and different people. I've got to imagine that for some of your board that might have seemed a little frightening or a little like, whoa, what's she doing? And I'm wondering with that type of potential division or an existing division, how has that played out? How has people how have people seen that? So there's a couple different points, um, and I wanna I wanna come back to the staff that work at ILADS, my team, and I I I think I am incredibly lucky that I stepped into a a highly expertise team um, that were unfortunately a little siloed in their um, in the, in their roles, and there was a there was um, uh, stay in your lane kind of yeah. mentality. And sure. I said, Oh no, 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 we, we, no, no, no. I don't have time for that. We don't have enough money for that. Come on. And I mean, when you've got, when you've got team members who have 20 plus years of experience in associations mm -hmm. and working, you know, hundreds of conferences and like, there's a, there's a brain trust. There's a hive mind here that I do not have all the answers and I will be the first to admit that. But my big answer is opening the door to, to a team that I, I had said, you know, I know we were kind of a divided team before. No, we come on ideas. Nothing is off the table and, and really bringing that team together 
was was huge, I think. And now and now they're they're really soaring. On the leadership perspective, there's a couple things. One, I had look of abject terror on the faces of many of the board members. Yeah. But I'm sure. they oh absolutely. But they trusted they trusted enough in their process that mm. brought me here that they gave me the benefit of the doubt. And I think that was huge. Um and I and and they still they would still question me and I encourage that questioning. And I mean, even some of the structure that we brought to the board meetings, and I'll, I'll give one example, very simplistic, but we didn't have this at, at ILADS. Um, I, I instituted a pre-reads document that, mm -hmm. um, and we just had a consent agenda so that we have a one hour right. meeting. We would spend half the time right. just on, you know, approving the minutes of the last yeah. meeting and looking at the financials and talking over things. And so, we're, we were not having the conversations that I thought and the board wanted to have. Mm -hmm. So even instituting some simple structure change and that changed a huge component of the board meetings that we have. Mm -hmm. um, and we meet on a monthly basis and like that, you could tell like, Oh, that's, that's new. We've, we've never done that. That's completely <laughs> changed. And it also required everybody to do some homework yeah. in between the meetings, which I'm not, yeah. I, I don't know how much they had done prior to that. But mm -hmm. again, they gave me the benefit of the doubt. And even though like you and I might think, wow, that's such a simple change. That was mm -hmm. mind bending yeah. to get to that. Yeah. And so that has opened the door now to, um, uh, we are now one cohesive voice um, and one cohesive board that are like, they're ready to dive into mm -hmm. all kinds of things. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of the consent agenda structure because to your point, um, you get people that are high functioning, high level folks that are experts in their area and then they're coming in and wasting time on, you know, some of these approval things where they, they could be doing the actual stewardship of the organization or the mission. And so good for you. And, and again, it's change. It's not easy. But then once um, I would imagine you, your team moves away from that board moves away from it. They'll be like, why didn't we always do this? Or, didn't we always <laughs> do this? Right. And, you know, they become uh, imbued with that process and they see the positivity of it and what, what other things they can get done. Let's, as we finish up, what do you see are some of the biggest threats to a nonprofit as you, you know, navigate this landscape, you've got um, a wide variety of, I would imagine personalities that you're dealing with um, and strong personalities. Talk to us about what you see here in terms of threat. So we, we mentioned this a little bit ago, but, um, and I know this is not going to be new and I know a lot of folks are going to just nod their head and you know, <laughs> kind of shake their eyes. Siloed information. It, it, it was, it was a big issue when I first came and I find with, with the leadership, the membership at large, staff, committees, you, it, it, that is a constant, um, you need to always be aware that that could happen. And it can be something as simple as, uh, what's it, the meeting after the meeting, when yes. all, all of our meetings are by Zoom, right? We, we, we come together in person a few times a year, but, but yeah. predominantly our, all of our meetings are Zoom, right? Mm -hmm. And and invariably, at the end of a meeting, one of the board members or a committee member will say, oh, hey, Sarah or so-and-so, can you stick around for a couple more minutes after the board meeting? And and I find that they they want to rehash something or they, they'll say like, well, I didn't say anything during the meeting, but here's really what my opinion is, right? Yeah. And that can absolutely be so detrimental. There's a time and place. I know there's some confidential issues. Um, sure. Like, I mean, we, we deal with HIPAA and things like that. So we're, mm -hmm. we're always cognizant of those kinds of things. But majority of the time, that is, that's just an, it's, that's a game, game ender to me. And so I've come to the point uh, when that happens, if, if I, if I'm catching the drift of what the individual is really talking, I'll say, well, wait, hold that thought, think through it, think on it. And then either maybe tomorrow or when we come together again, you can you can write it in, you know, you, if you're not good at confrontation, um, you can you can write it or you can. But somehow otherwise appropriately bring it to the forefront because you're doing yourself a disservice by by not speaking up and not sharing your opinion. Um, right. And I've gotten to the point of telling people, like, what's the worst that could happen? I mean, you know, the, 
they might yell at you, but they're on Zoom. I can mute them. I have the power to mute them if that's the case, but but nothing that, like that's ever going to happen. Um, so that's right. really important. I think that's it, you know, and, and that's uh, it, going back to our conversation and framing it in terms of culture. That's a, a sense of, you know, do I have the, the voice or the process to to communicate, share my truth, object or whatever? Um, and I think sometimes, you know, a way to get around that is to, to honor the quorum issue, to say, look, you know, this is a great topic. This is a, a generative discussion that we need to have, but we need to put this in the right structure and framework. So let's let's move that to our next meeting or, you know, something like that so that it is um, it is given voice. But it's also it's somewhat manipulative, I think, for boards to do that side table conversation. And to your point, Sarah, it, it for the executive director or even the board chair, that needs to be brought up because that's just so negative. Absolutely. And to yeah. that end, can absolutely divide a, yes. a, a unit. Absolutely. And I've seen it happen, not not necessarily here at ILADS, but I've seen it happen. Yeah. And, and that's when you kind of look back like, wow, I could have stopped that three times and that would have probably changed the, the trajectory. trajectory of this. Yeah. The other component that we are really big at is, um, is training that leadership, and I know you and I have mentioned this, um, Julia, and I, and I know this is really, this is gonna be in your your bailiwick, um, <laughs> but really training those board members who've yeah. never sat on a board, right. never sat in a committee, don't, I, I actually had to talk about what Robert's rules of orders were. Oh, yeah, and, yes. And, right? Yes. We need to hire you to do a, to do a training probably to, yeah. to uh, for our board for that kind of thing. But that like simple, mm -hmm. basic things that I feel like a lot of us take for granted, Right. They've never had and and really are soak up that in, that information. Mm -hmm. So I yeah. you, it's so quick to turn what a threat would be into a, such a great positive. And then, hey, bonus, other members will want to join the board and committees because they see, hey, I'm going to get training on this, which is going to help mm -hmm. me for multiple things. And not only, you know, build my experience and professionalism. Yeah. It's a huge thing. And, and that I, I think, um, you know, uh, that's kind of like one of my core beliefs is that I, I think everybody comes into this sector wanting to do well and wanting to do good. Right. But they just don't always know how to do it. And then what's the first thing that happens? You start to disengage and you mm -hmm. start to pull back because nobody wants to fail. Right. Nobody wants to to not do what they said they were going to do. And so it's just easier to disengage. And so I believe we've got to, as a society, as an aging society, we need to be doing this so that we get those people, you know, who's, who's next, you know, we do that in sports, you know, we use that, that phrase, who's, who's on the bench, right? Who's next, who's up next. And so we've got to pull that into our culture because if we don't, um, I, I think you're the perfect example of an organization that had steady leadership going in the same direction. Those board members probably thought that it's going to be like this forever. <laughs> easy street. We're on easy street. Yeah. And then one day it's like, oh, wait, no, we're oh, not. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, this has been a delight to talk to you. I really, really have enjoyed this. And I I love, um, Sarah, that you, you have an organization that um, is so vital to so many parts of our communities um, and that you have to fight the fight of communication and, and advocating for your work and your, your structure. And at the same time, you're just like everyone else. You got to battle the things that go on to, to keep the engine going. Right. It's, yeah. it's fascinating. And uh, so Sarah Quillen, executive director of international Lyme and associated diseases society, I lads check them out. Um, they are really doing some fascinating work. I don't care what it is you do in the nonprofit sector. I think you can learn from a structure like this. Mm -hmm. How do they take a complicated idea that people have opinions about? First off, I was like, well, I live in the West. We don't have to worry about that. Not so fast. <laughs> and that you helped educate me, right? I mean, what 
what lessons that we can learn from from this type of an organization super powerful again i l a d s dot org ilads and you can learn about sarah her work and her team and what they're doing um, it's, it's been a fascinating conversation. It really, really has. You know, another thing that's fascinating about the work that we do each and every day on the nonprofit shows, we have longtime supporters who really get behind what we do. And they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part-Time Controller, Fundraisers Friday, and 180 Management Group. Wow, you've really energized me. I loved this conversation, um, Sarah, about culture, your own experience, and, and how we can all improve what we're what it is we're trying to do. Thank you so much for having me on here. It is truly the honor has absolutely been mine, Julia. Thank you. It's been a lot of fun. Hey, everybody, you know, we we end this broadcast every day, every day with the same message. And truly, Sarah, it, it means different things to me every day I say it. Um, but today it really means something because it involves, you know, health wellness. And, um, and it, the message is like this, to stay well so you can do well. Thanks, everyone.